Good morning, everyone. Um, so while the, the slides are just coming up, I just want to say that um, my talk is going to focus on surveillance. Uh, and I don't want you to think that um, I'm an anarchist nihilist. Uh, as a result of it. I do believe in government and good government, uh, and that government is good for delivering services. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk. Am I on the mic? Mic is good? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about surveillance, state freedom, and whistleblowing um, in the new tech world. Uh, in every community, there's a necessary balance between the rights of citizen and the powers of the state. And I actually think that ours is currently out of balance. Um, there is, in a sense, too much surveillance from uh, government to governments, not just our government, uh, and not enough control by the average citizenry about their data and information. Um, I, one of the things I'm going to talk about in this talk is whistleblowing, because I've been uh, project managing a three now, it's turned into a four year study of the impact of digital technology. Uh, on whistleblowing. It's an international study, which I'll show you uh, some of the very early results from, uh, from Griffith, Melbourne University, uh, and Georgetown with some additional researchers from University of Edinburgh and a couple of other places. So the first thing I want to talk about is the evolution to the post-Snowden world. I'm sure you all have heard of Edward Snowden uh, and his significant leaks over the last many months. Um, I think the key elements to this evolution that we've seen in the post-Snowden world is We've had the era of the war on terror. We've had increased militarization. We've had state-based or affiliated actors in larger numbers. We've had a substantial growth in the corporate espionage, hacking, uh, and corporate power arena. Um, and then along came something new, which was this era of the whistleblower. Uh, there are different academic definitions for a whistleblower. What's really interesting in the current era we live in is how whistleblowing and technology and anonymity uh, have all converged to produce some very interesting outcomes. Um, the definition that I'm going to use here is drawn from classic definitions in the academic literature and also some adaptation from my international research team uh, and also from the, there's an international research network about whistleblowing uh, that we uh, ran our survey and, and, and some other material by as well. So a whistleblower is someone who reveals information from inside an organization. You'll see in some of the slides I refer to it as inside information. It's not insider trading information in this context. It's just about information from inside an organization. They don't have to be a traditional employee anymore, and in fact, there's whistleblower protection legislation that's uh, been passing in various states in Australia, and indeed federally, um, about five hours before the Gillard government uh, fell, or Gil I should say before Gillard fell, um, uh, I was sitting in the gallery at the Senate watching the um, whistleblowing legislation for the Commonwealth government pass, which was a very good thing. And it's actually, for the areas that it covers, it's pretty good legislation. Um, it can be a con contractor or subcontractor. It's about serious wrongdoing, so it's not trivial matters. Uh, and it's blowing the whistle to someone who they think uh, they you know, believe can do something or can act on, on, the, uh, on the information. So one of the really most important findings that uh, the literature shows us, and indeed our own research showed us, is that most whistleblowers, their m primary motivation is just to get action on the wrongdoing. That's what they want. They just want someone to action it. Um, there may be other motivations as well, but that's the primary one. So, in the pre-Snowden and pre-Manning world, the whistleblower was a rat, a dibby dobber, a turncoat, uh, but not anymore. In the world today, a whistleblower is, oops, let's see if we can get that slide up, public perceptions. So um, this survey that we put together from the research project, which is an online survey, you can go and fill it out if you like, um, it's got uh, 43 questions, so that should be about the same amount of time it'll take me to finish the uh, the talk. Um, we asked, how would you generally describe people who reveal information about serious wrongdoing inside organizations to um, the media? And this is what we found, uh, that in fact whistleblowers are not really um, misfits or villains or rats. They are predominantly normal or heroes. And indeed, if you combine those two categories, 
um, the large majority of people think that they're you know, normal or heroes. They're not um, aberrant villains or misfits. So that's a sort of significant change that's occurred um, in this post-Snowden era. The other thing that's interesting is, uh, I will just give you a bit of background on the study. That's where the study is. It's in 10 languages, just in case you don't like English. Um, the, um, this is just a bit about how we did it. We piloted, we refined the survey. I won't go into a lot of detail on that because um, you can go and look online if you want to read it. But um, we took a subset of the questions and various groups or sections of our research team or people affiliated with it um, ran those in detailed um, general population random sample polls, stratified random sampling. That's like the gold standard for how you do surveys. Um, we couldn't do it with all 43 questions because it's very expensive to do this kind of polling. Um, but we did it for a set of the key questions um, done in the UK, Australia, and Iceland with some help. Uh, and so I've got some comparison of these results that'll show you a little, give you a little bit more of a window into what people think, what the general population thinks about whistleblowers. The, um, the first question that we asked was to try and gauge people's um, view about whether the level of secrecy of information inside organizations was at the right level or was it too high or too low? Did it need to be changed? And it's an interesting barometer for how people are thinking about openness and transparency, I think, in their societies in general. So we asked, is it the right amount too much or too little information kept uh, secret inside organizations in your society? And these are the figures we came up with. Um, about half of Australians said there's too much secrecy, which is higher than I thought it would be. In the UK, it's even higher at 54%. In Iceland, it's 63%. In fact, only a quarter of the population here think it's at the right amount, um, which suggests to me that perhaps we need a little more openness, transparency, and general open source philosophy. Um, then we gauge public attitudes to whistleblowing questions about what someone thinks should happen in their society in terms of this openness, transparency, and um, and whether whistleblowers should be supported or punished. So we asked whether people should be supported for revealing serious wrongdoing, even if it meant revealing information inside the organization, or whether they um, should be punished, even if they were revealing serious wrongdoing. So we tried to make people think a little bit before they answered the question about what the ramifications would be. Uh, and these are the figures we've got, which are massive, really. I mean, if you have a political advisor to a minister and you get polling figures back that are like 65% or 67%, they've got little heart palpitations going. So to get 81%, 81%, very interesting, they're the same figures. Um, and 87% just goes to show how strong the public support is for supporting those people who whistleblow uh, and similarly, we asked about going to the media, whether someone should be able to go to the media and which instance, first, last option, uh, or for in a particular situation, for a particular reason. And uh, basically, 87% of people, up to 90% of people said whistleblowers should be able to go to the media, they should be protected for going to the media in one of the first or last option categories. And the numbers of people who said they should never be able to go to the media are really minuscule. So again, not only is there huge public support for um, this kind of safety valve on wrongdoing in our society, but there's huge public support for being able to protect whistleblowers who go to the media. So I think what it'd be fair to say is that the public wants whistleblowers to be properly protected by law, by their institutions, and by society across a set of societies. Um, if we get more grant funding, we'll be doing it across a set of other countries as well. Um, and that whistleblowers should be able to go to the media and the internet. The internet was particularly one of the questions, and in fact, we will be publishing on issues of whether they want to use Twitter, et cetera. We found the numbers for using um, whether people would be willing to use social media were surprisingly low, sort of in the seven, six, seven percent range, but using other types of internet-based um, communications was higher, more like 18, 19 percent. So now the question is, you know, why is there this huge support um, that we see in the population. I mean, Australia traditionally has had a really bad attitude towards Dibby Dovers, um, you know, some time ago, and, and then, then we see that this is quite the opposite now. And I think the reason is because people have lost a lot of faith in the political process and in our politicians, uh, and particularly in uh, this era 
of universal deceit. So I happen to love George Orwell, whose real name is Eric Blair. I wrote a th thesis on him, actually. I've read everything that he ever wrote for publication. Um, one of my favorite quotes from him is, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Now, I happen to think that um, people who are involved in the open source movement are by nature revolutionary, even if they happen to be quiet geeks, just by virtue of being involved in what open source is. I think it's pretty revolutionary. Um, so you may feel some affinity um, with this view. But I think telling the truth in this society today is, has become, in a sense, a revolutionary act. Um, George Orwell would know a bit about this because for a period of time he actually worked for the BBC um, uh, writing propaganda uh, during World War II. And even though um, the forces at work against the British in World War II were so horrendous and what they were doing was so horrendous, he actually gave up part way through and left because he couldn't stomach um, continuing to write propaganda. He couldn't stomach the deceit, even though it was for what everyone knew was a, a great and good cause. Those who, tell, who seek to tell the truth these days, whistleblowers, publishers, journalists, academics, face basically dangerous times and a David and Goliath battle. Um, they're stopped at borders, um, they're detained, they have their belongings seized, they're harassed, um, as you would have seen the David Miranda case being stopped in the UK uh, with data and transit to Glenn Greenwald in Brazil. Um, they live in exile, but in, from places like the UK, uh, people like Sarah Harrison, um, who was uh, instrumental in, in guiding Edward Snowden to safety uh, in Russia, um, uh, and also from the US and even Australia. And, and ironically, Australia has be, uh, sorry, Russia has become the, the safe haven. Um, and elected members of representative bodies are lied to or are, are deceived. So I, I'll just mention one particular case. You might know a bit about what I refer to as the clapper trap. So this is where U.S. Senator Ron Wyden had asked the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And Clapper responded, no, sir, not wittingly. This was clearly a deceit. Um, and uh, what he should have actually answered if he'd been telling the truth about the surveillance state is, yes, sir. I will not commit perjury or breach my oath of allegiance to the people. We do collect such data wittingly, daily, comprehensively, and unconstitutionally. We're defiant and aggressive. We do it all secretly, and we lie to the courts about it. We make claims about connections to 9-11 that we know are claptrap. Yes, sir, we have built a massive machine of surveillance, both secretly and unlawfully, and we are using it to spy on millions of innocent citizens. That would have been the truthful answer, but he didn't give that answer. Instead, what he recommended was that uh, Edward Snowden be considered a traitor, that the former head of the CIA said Snowden should be hung and left to swing from a very tall oak tree, that Mike Huckabee, that bastion of progressiveness, uh, wanted whistleblower Bradley Manning to be executed, that Peter King wanted to put WikiLeaks on a terrorist organization list as a publisher, and yet Americans uh, have passed a judgment on Edward Snowden, and that judgment is that the majority think he did a good thing. I don't think that history will treat Clapper and Co. well. It remains to be seen, but that's my prediction. Meanwhile, the spies and the generals are spending our tax money chasing really dangerous people. So what sort of people are they chasing? Well, Klingons. As you may know, General Alexander, head of the NSA, had his command center designed like the bridge of Star Trek Enterprise. It's very useful if you need to chase down some Klingons. Uh, also, oops, let's see if we can, orcs, orcs. Yeah, they're dangerous. Um, so you may have seen uh, just in the past month or so revelations that the NSA and GCHQ infiltrated World of Warcraft, Second Life, and Xbox Live Network uh, uh, to spy on, um, in fact, what they described it as infiltrating the gaming, the online game community was an opportunity. 
There was no mention of actually any terrorists in there. There could be terrorists in there, however. No evidence of terrorists in there, but that didn't matter because obviously some guy was sitting that day playing online and his boss got him at work and he said, oh, it's an opportunity. Clearly there are terrorists hiding in here. That's why I'm doing it. And from there, a whole NSA spy program was born. Uh, so, so I like the fact that there are so many different agencies in there and so many different teams that they had to set up a de-conflict um, team so that the spies would stop spying and interacting with each other, which is <laughs> particularly amusing. Um, also, those dangerous geeks and activists, clearly, they're a problem. So I liked uh, General Michael Hayden's comments about Snowden supporters are, quote, nihilists, anarchists, activists, lulsec, anonymous, 20-somethings who haven't talked to the opposite sex in five or six years. <laughs> Hands up if this is you. <laughs> um, but, you know, clearly they're dangerous and they need to be watched closely. So it's good to know that our tax money is being spent well. Um, I actually say on a more serious note that we've reached a state of security saturation. That's what I call it. And that's where there is so much money going into the surveillance state, they can't actually figure out how to spend it all. So I, um, I had a conversation with someone uh, from Government Accountability Project in the US, which is one of the largest and most important whistleblowing NGOs, actually, in the world. They do fantastic work. And I said, so you know, how much does the surveillance state spend, for example, in the United States? And they said, actually, we don't know. We can't find out. We sort of, we know it's above this amount, but we don't actually know, because it's one of those things that's classified. So th that just gives you an idea. It's so big that it's not possible to actually reveal it in all of its glory. Um, I actually say that when you reach security saturation, one additional dollar spent is like lighting it on fire. It achieves no additional benefit to society except to warm your fingers. Um, and when you have people chasing orcs and falling all over each other to, to find them, that's really when you realize. Um, if you go uh, and look at the Guardian piece that first broke that story and read the many messages of responses to the story, you will see a pretty outraged public, largely British in that case, but um, that their tax money is being spent, whether it's GCHQ or organizations here, on, on this sort of thing. Uh, so I, I got an interesting... Um, uh, email from a law student the other day who had tried to map out um, the ways in which the government in Australia uh, is able to spy on its citizenry, what legal avenues it uses and what um, a path it will follow. Uh, and, and from that I started thinking about how would someone, if they were trying to go through public FOI or other mechanisms, um, try and get their own file, for example, after a period of time had passed, um, and this was, um, this was the diagram that the law student um, presented. Uh, what could possibly go wrong uh, in this? I think this is, you know, very, very illustrative. I haven't gone through it in great detail because clearly having a PhD doesn't qualify you enough to be able to unravel that. Um, nonetheless, it's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting example. So now I want to just talk about a very brief case study that's come up really in the past couple of days. Um, on how a surveillance state grows in seemingly benign ways here um, in, uh, in Australia, particularly in Victoria. So there are lots of good reasons why the state will want to get a lot of data on its citizens and use them to provide better services. And you want those things, that's good. But you might want people to have the option to opt out as well. Um, and not having that option to opt out is bad. And not having transparency about what is being done with that data is bad. So the particular case, which I actually was interviewed for ABC TV about a couple of days ago, is called the Insight Platform. Uh, it's in Victoria, and it's going to be a cradle to graduation state tracking of children. Uh, and it's the press release um, was quite promising, really. Uh, it says that, you know, year 12 and other assessments would be moved to a sort of a, a one-stop shop where teachers would be able to view the student's assessment um, over time and presumably give highly informed advice about 
uh, their studies. You can see the media release online. Um, it would include online assessments in English, math, health and physical education, so a little bit outside the traditional just your average math test, but nonetheless potentially quite useful. Um, and particularly designed to, quote, help teachers better tailor their lessons to individual students. We think this is a good use for these things. But there's a bit of creep going on here. So when um, I actually looked at the tender, uh, which is out there, for the reporting and analytics component of this Insight platform, it reads slightly differently. And, um, you know, to some degree, you have to have a slightly paranoid mind to have your antenna buzz at these things. But the tender calls for assessment analytic products to be populated with assessment data from a range of assessments across multiple development curriculum frameworks to provide a picture of individual projects. So this is one citizen view and achievement. Uh, and it's going to include all sorts of assessments uh, from maternal and child health assessments right up through year 12. Now, this is kind of interesting. Oh, I've got a bit of feedback there. So if your child was at a maternal and child health care center and they got an assessment, let's say they have a, a learning disability, they've got dyslexia, they've got autism, they have hearing impairments, they've got behavioral problems. It's all in one convenient place now. This Insight platform will have it all. Um, so then I started to think, oh, well, I wonder if all private schools will have to submit their data and how willing they'll be to do that. Can you actually opt out of it? And what about religious schools? Will the database also include data on how many times you attend a synagogue or a mosque or a church? Uh, and who will have access to this data? Is it just the teacher doing the assessment or is it going to be some centralized office analytics software, one person view? And how long will the data be retained for? And will it be sent overseas to a foreign power? Um, what are the data security regimes? So just as a reference point, a comparison to this, I do a bit of um, research in the e-health space. And the PCEHR health records, which is sort of a comprehensive record that's being brought out, has got a set of legislative protections on it regarding data sovereignty, for example, where the data has to be stored on Australian servers and not, it's not supposed to leave the country. So a question was put by a reporter to the education minister in Victoria, what data protections and privacy protections will there be in this new Insight platform? Um, and what data sovereignty regimes? And what are the data retention rules on it? And his response was, oh, it's up to the winning tender supplier to decide them. Because <laughs> you know, those vendors, they're really good on privacy and data sovereignty regimes, right? <laughs> they're, they're meant to be policy people. Interestingly, this tender has a particular element in it that says the department is keen to engage with overseas vendors as part of the procurement. There could be a reason for this. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. However, you'd hope that data sovereignty would have a component in the tender specs. Of course, you can't get the details of the tender specs unless you've got an ABN and you're a company and you're registered and you jump through 50,000 hoops. So it's not even very transparent to look at what the details are of it. So I thought, what sort of overseas vendors might get preference? for this sort of thing. Someone like Dell, maybe, they do a lot in the education space. Um, and what happens if it is an overseas vendor? Does that data, that very intimate data, potentially about our children, about their learning difficulties, about other things that may affect them from the age of three or four on up, um, does it get shipped to a server in, say, Utah? Or kept forever? These are really alarming questions. And um, I don't see an adequate response from some of the levels of government in Australia. Certainly, there are good people in good governments around Australia um, who try and make sure that um, privacy is a priority and that the surveillance state is not allowed to ship records wholesale to foreign powers. But there is a lot more apathy and lack of policy interest in this than there should be. And we need to be concerned about that. So um, we've seen the reach, a bit of the reach of the surveillance state. But how sophisticated is it? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the sophistication elements. So uh, just coming to Dell, since I mentioned Dell. I don't know that they are the vendor, but they kind of fit the profile. This is a document that's come out uh, just recently. Um, and as you'll see from the TS, that would indicate top secret. 
Um, God Surge uh, runs on the Fluxabit hardware implant and provides software applications presence in Dell Edge servers. Um, it exploiting, a, anyway, I won't go into the detail of it, but you can see this just to show you a little bit about God Surge. Uh, you can see it targets Dell through interdiction, otherwise known as we grab your package, your you know, server as it's being shipped to you and fiddle with it and then put it back in the mail to you, or otherwise interfere with it in other ways. Um, you can see how a target system uh, can be interfered with. Um, and indeed, um, there's a whole, in a sense, uh, shopping catalog, um, like a sort of an L.L. Bean or other shopping catalog for these sorts of um, fantastically, in some cases, sophisticated attacks uh, on uh, machines in order to get the data. And this is just a good example of one. And it's relatively cheap. So it's only $500 for hardware and installation. Um, clearly, they're not charging enough. Uh, <laughs> if they have to go in, you know, they're, you guys are obviously on better rates than they are. Um, if they have to go in and interfere, but you can, you can see a little bit about uh, how that operates. I'll show you a couple of others. Um, so Deity Bounce, who names these things? They're fantastic. <laughs> Deity Bounce provides software applications persistence on Dell. Again, we like Dell. Um, PowerEdge servers by exploiting the motherboard BIOS utilizing system management mode um, to gain periodic execution while the operating system loads. So here's a nice diagram with the lovely target systems down here. Presumably only the ones in red are being targeted, haha, -ha. um, and uh, or not, as the case may be. Uh, but behind the internet, there's this whole other world um, of ArcStream and SneakerNet. You know, obviously they're fans of movies from the early 1990s, uh, um, of, uh, of people who can access data um, using this product that's available, that, but not to us. Um, of course, it's not just Dell. According to uh, NSA documents about quantum theory, every attempt to implant uh, iOS will be, always be successful, which um, I came to mind was the line from Stairway to Heaven, and it makes you wonder um, about what arrangements may have been put in place for that. So uh, just to show that Dell isn't the only show in town, Dropout Jeep um, is a straight bazaar, also fabulously named, based software implant for the Apple iPhone operating system, uses the chimney pool framework. <laughs> you know. um, and uh, uh, it's compliant with the free flow project. Um, you, know, you just have a sense of orcs, orcs everywhere. Uh, and therefore, it's supported by the turbulence architecture. But I like this loop. This is a great loop. It's like the iPhone accepts a request, retrieves requested SIGINT data, encrypt and send XFIL data, the NSA operator loads specific modules, sends data requests. It's just an endless loop of send us your private data. Um, and if you read down here, uh, You've got all sorts of functionality, including the ability to remotely push-pull files from the device, SMS retrieval, contact list retrieval. <laughs> Your friends and family will love you. Uh, and um, voicemail, geolocation. I like the hot mic myself. That's my favorite. Are uh, you listening, guys? And uh, <laughs> camera capture, also. Uh, cell tower location. Um, really, it's just a one-stop shop. Um, want more for your phone? So does the NSA. Uh, <laughs> you'll see up here um, another uh, monkey calendar um, is uh, uh, yet another useful thing. Its unit cost is zero, not of course to us, but to them. Um, but I thought you know interesting is depending on the service provider security configuration, um, which is illustrative. And I'll just do one or two more of these. Um, oh, look, wait, there's some Linux up there. Uh, <laughs> this technique supplies, um, supports single or multiprocessor systems running Windows, Linux, et cetera. Um, again, interdiction, ArcStream uh, is the code name for that. You know, if this doesn't alarm you, it should. Um, 
And <laughs> so I, I, I put this one up because I really like this one, which is spy more for less. You know, you can just see an advertisement internally for this. If you can just get an extra 15 or so targets, you can drop your unit price down from $1,000 each uh, to $750 <laughs> going cheap. <laughs> $2 shop special um, for Howler Monkey, also fabulously named, um, and Suit Your Sailor. Uh, but you get a sense here of more very powerful ways to um, interfere in people's privacy. Uh, this was my personal favorite, not just for the name Surly Spawn. <laughs> Um, but I like this because it gathers keystrokes without needing any software running on the target system. Woo! -woo! <laughs> so um, uh, this one for FBY for the Five Eyes. That's us. Um, Surly Spawn is the capability to gather keystrokes without requiring any software running on the targeted system. It also only requires that the target system be touched once, just once, touched for the very first time. <laughs> The reflector, retro reflector is compatible with both USB and PC2 keyboards. The simplicity of the design allows the form factor to be tailored for specific operational requirements, and future capabilities will include laptop keyboards. Very encouraging. Um, there's a bit more of the concept of operation down here. I like the bottom line. Surly Spawn is part of the angry neighbor family of radar retrospective <laughs> <laughs> reflectors. <laughs> I think you'd have some very angry neighbors indeed. Um, <laughs> so if I could just talk for a couple of minutes about a record, report card on building the total surveillance state. Now, there may be some people uh, who disagree with my status on this. When I use the word met, I mean not that we've actually ticked every single box, but we're well on our way to, um, to achieving that point. So, if we say, okay, what does the report card look like? If you were gonna build the perfect surveillance state, you'd want to um, have a set of bulk collections all digitized that can be analyzed, and it's still gotta be cross-linked, but we're, we're moving pretty fast on, on that ticket box. Um, ongoing storage for long-term data retention, especially of citizens' data and communications. We've got some constraints on reconnaissance and satellite-based feed, but we're going pretty well on achieving that box as well. Um, total data capture across the state, data plus finance, telecom, travel, medical, education, taxes, law enforcement, it's not yet fully linked. Um, but there are significant advances and there's certainly work that's in the pipeline towards achieving some of those ends. Co-option of big data players, um, including hardware, software, firmware, data, organizational loyalty, knowingly or not. You would have perhaps heard of the large New York Times ad taken out by a set of the large tech companies in the US going, no, 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 we think this is really bad. Um, <laughs> and that, that's a great first step. Um, uh, hopefully they'll actually continue that pressure on government. Well, that would appear to be uh, on its way as well. Legal cover is sufficient. We've got secret legal opinions, the FISA court in the US, um, classified approaches, justifications, Congress and Parliament is largely under management. That's pretty well met. Um, although there's been a bit of pushback recently because of whistleblowing. The aim of one view of citizen across interactions across a lifetime, lifetime, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. We, you know, why stop at, um, at some areas when you can move into education and perhaps health? Um, the objective of total information awareness by government is getting closer. Uh, and the consequence management of aberrant data is really just in the early stages except for deportations. Um, uh, I guess, you know, my, my comment again, I started at the beginning and I, and I say this is true. Yes, it is good that you can amalgamate a set of data and provide better service if you're government, but the power of government is granted by the people and to such a more significant level than private industry um, that it also must be counterbalanced. And I don't think that we're at that right counterbalance point to be able to say that privacy and data sovereignty um, have been adequately met, given the sophistication that's been brought to bear uh, against our privacy. Now I'm gonna jump to what you can do. Um, and that quote by Orwell, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Um, if you see serious wrongdoing, don't stand by and do nothing. 
call it out. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly um, interested in what people's views are about at what point they think it's okay for state surveillance to be used for certain things. So I'd be interested to see a show of hands. Who thinks it's reasonable to use the powers of the state for surveillance if you are going to investigate with some evidence and proper court orders the idea that someone might blow up a shopping center somewhere in urban Australia? Hands up. Pretty good show. Okay. How many of you think it's reasonable to use the powers of the state for surveillance on people who might be activists supporting um, West Papuans who just want clean water from uh, a large mining site, foreign mining site, uh, that is polluting the water of their villages? How many of you think that's reasonable for state surveillance uh, to be used? <laughs> Yeah, not so much. And so how many of you think it's reasonable to be using state surveillance uh, on behalf of the Motion Picture Authority of America, <laughs> the recording industry of America, uh, and other um, IP type collectors uh, <laughs> against um, average you know, kids who copy a bit of music in Australia? Yeah, that's right. Internet filtering. That's, that's what we need it for. So um, I think we can see there's a pretty clear <laughs> differentiation between what is um, an acceptable use and what is not. And I'm interested to know also, hands up, how many of you think that it's reasonable to use Australia's formidable state surveillance apparatus to spy on one of the newest and poorest countries in our region, East Timor, um, in order to gain uh, advantage in negotiations around um, the East Timor Gap and, and gas fields. Oh, we've got one brave person. Um, and do you still think it would be reasonable to use that for advantage if, for example, oh, I don't know, the minister involved had a close relationship with the oil company and might or might not uh, have been promised ongoing expensive board positions after he left his job in government? Nope, not making the accusation, just asking, just asking. <laughs> just asking if that looks like a reasonable use of state surveillance. Um, uh, didn't see any hands going up to that one. I don't know that that's the case. Time will tell. Um, I think it's reasonable to use state surveillance cheap to be a Yes. Yes. Exactly, I agree, 100%. In fact, it's interesting, I, when I started the whistleblowing study, um, I thought that Canberra was a really clean place. And <laughs> uh, I know, I'm a little Pollyanna, what can I say? And um, the more I got into it, the more I was astonished. I still think that actually at the middle and lower levels of the bureaucracy, it is actually pretty, it is relatively clean compared to most countries. Um, at the very top and, boy, at the political level, uh, it's another thing. And in fact, I, I suspect, I don't know, if I were working for a surveillance agency, I'd, I would find it very hard not to, uh, not to squeal like a stuck pig against some of the things that really happen in Canberra regarding our political elite. Um, and I think that comes back to why people feel there's too much secrecy in society. Um, uh, I'm working on a paper at the moment around whether um, debating whether or not transparency has become, in a sense, um, the replacement for trust in our modern society because there isn't the trust, because perhaps there isn't the quality or integrity um, in politicians that we hoped that there would be. I don't have an easy answer to it, um, but I think it's an interesting proposition. It was actually put by one of the people, uh, a New Zealander, who founded um, Transparency International. Uh, and I think there's some merit to the argument. Um, a couple of key points on what you can do. Australia, New Zealand, and other citizens need to demand data sovereignty um, as policy at all levels of government. It's really important. I mean, it's one thing to have allies, and allies are great. That doesn't mean you have to give over lots of detail. Data is shipped to the US. Um, so it happens for passports, travel arrangements, five million Australians' facial recognition data. Really? Five million terrorists here in Australia? I don't think so. Um, but it's not just their facial recognition software. It's your religious affiliations according to your, what meals you order on a plane. 
your sexual preferences. In fact, in, in Europe, they demanded that that data be pulled out. Um, your credit card, who you sit next to, not to mention what your holiday plans are, just in case they wanted to come along. Um, <laughs> Some specifics of what I would say you as a unique community can do um, is to get political because it really matters. It matters a lot right now. Um, I'm not saying any one political party is right or wrong, but um, find the good politicians and back them because there aren't very many of them in my view, really honest, good politicians who know about tech and care about tech and understand what data sovereignty is and want to do something about it. Um, Scott Ludlam is one of them, um, but he's rare. And so if you're here in WA, I would urge you to find out what Scott stands for and vote for him if you agree with it. Certainly, if I lived in WA, I would vote for him. Um, join online activist sites, political parties, go to meetings and speak up. You know, there's been a massive dwindling of membership in the major political parties because <laughs> who would want to join them, right? Um, but the downside to that is you just end up with a smaller and smaller pool of hacks who aren't demanding better quality policy outcomes, and that's a bad thing. It used to be that the policy committees of things like the ALP were actually really active and vibrant places 20, 25 years ago where people debated things of content, and they made sure that at least some good policies got pushed up to the top and were inflicted on ministers even if they didn't want them. Um, that happens less and less. Because you know, where once you had four branches of the ALP, now you have one or half a branch because everyone's just fled. Um, it's not only the ALP, liberal numbers as well. Um, write privacy enhancing software. God, you guys are special, really. You are gems. Um, and uh, you are in a unique position to affect change. Um, write defensive and detective software for average people to use. We need more anonymizing options. Um, we worked on the whistleblowing project on a particular bit of um, beta software for uh, anonymizing people who want to participate. Um, particularly, we were worried about people from countries where their safety is perhaps not so assured for free speech. But everyone, really, um, because you say to people on a whistleblowing survey, don't give any personal information about yourself. Don't tell us about your whistleblowing experiences. And then people write in and give you lots of detail about these things. So we were very worried um, about them remaining anonymous. And um, working with some pretty qualified um, crypto engineering types, it was a really hard problem. So um, this is a room full of exceptionally smart and talented people. The more anonymizing technologies we can get out there, the better. Um, and help people detect intrusion by government because uh, I think most of us in this room wouldn't be involved in terrorism or other things that would warrant real you know, intrusion into our privacy. Um, get involved in not-for-profits that give tech support to journalists, NGOs, and average citizens. And in fact, I'm involved in a very embryonic project to do something along this line um, because I believe so strongly that this is really critical. I can't tell you, I don't know why, but the number of requests I get from journalists um, and, uh, and just small NGO activists, not just in Australia but overseas, who for some reason think that I um, can solve their problems end to end for them. I wish I could, um, but there is a real demand for this. Um, and if you can donate, you don't have to donate money, but just even half a Saturday now and again, um, your tech skills are really valuable for this sort of thing. Um, if you work for government, contractor or otherwise um, employed, use your voice, don't exit. Use your voice and tell them that the level of surveillance is not okay. That it's one thing to collect private information about the citizenry, it's another thing to use it for nefarious purposes or to ship it wholesale to foreign powers. It's really, really important because you guys are the ones who can stand up and say, you know, yes, it is technically possible to stop just shipping wholesale data. No, we don't have to do it this way. Um, a lot of times, even if you have a good manager who's got no tech background, they'll be befuddled by someone who goes, no, 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 we have to ship 5 million facial recognition records. It's the only way to do it. Um, so I think that's really important. I've got a list of acknowledgements of people who've contributed um, those uh, terrific tech slides um, from Jake Applebaum uh, and people on my research team as well. Um, and I think we've got just a couple minutes for questions. I hope I haven't made it hard for you guys to sleep well at night, but <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to chat with anyone who wants to afterwards. I hope you've enjoyed my little tour down surveillance lane. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.